Welcome to the Men's Reformed Fellowship, a ministry of First Presbyterian Church in Percocy, Pennsylvania. Today is October the 4th, 2018, and we are making our way through Dr. R.C. Sproul's book, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith. Today we are on chapter 8 on interpreting the Bible. We considered in our last meeting the canon of Scripture, uh, that rule of faith, that list of documents that we receive as inspired inerrant Scripture. The Old and New Testaments given in their original documents are the inspired inerrant Word of God. That is our rule of faith. Everything that is in those documents uh, judge us and govern our lives. We have copies of those manuscripts. We have translations of them into different languages. Those many copies and uh, translations have been wonderfully preserved by God through history such that they are pure, without error, and we can rest in that which they have to say with great confidence, knowing that we have the full message of the gospel contained therein and all that we need to know for life and godliness to assert the purity, the essential purity of God's word that has come down to us today all these many centuries later is not to uh, suggest that there are copies of the original manuscripts that are inerrant without error, nor is it to say that there is a translation or body of translations that are inerrant or without error. We do recognize what is historical fact, which is observable which if you take the opportunity to, to compare manuscripts, you will find that there are errors in the documents. There are not errors so much as to deny the gospel, deny the way of life through Jesus Christ. They are consistent and pure in that respect, but uh, small errors in words, variants, readings, and these kinds of things do occur over the course of time, but those variant readings have no bearing on the message of the gospel itself. Uh, I had an example of that in our last sermon at First Church on or excuse me, September the 30th, where we spoke from John chapter 5, where the, the older translations, like the King James Version, include a verse around verse 3 and 4, which asserts that an angel came down from heaven, stirred the waters at the pool of Bethesda, and when those waters were stirred, uh, the invalids, uh, blind, the lame, uh, the sick, would, would uh, jump into that pool, and the first one that got in the pool was healed of whatever their disease was. That is a story that is included in the older translations, but modern translations do not include that. The reason why the modern ones do not include that little story, that verse or so, verse and a half, is because the oldest manuscripts that have now become available to us, that have been there this whole period of time, preserved by the Holy Spirit and kept for us, for our uh, benefit, uh, these older manuscripts do not include that story in there. And when you look at that text, you ask yourself the question, why was that story removed from the text if it was there originally? And there can be no reason for that. Why would anyone wish to remove that uh, portion out of the text? One would want to keep it in there because it seems to provide a reason for the event in which Jesus approaches the invalid by that pool and asks him whether he wants to get well. And so uh, the story would seem to flow naturally within the text. And there's nothing in that story that would be disharmonious or uh, contrary to the remainder of Scripture. So it seems, would seem to be consistent with the text. So why would anyone pull that text out? There's no good reason for that. Clearly, it can't be because of an anti-supernaturalistic bias. The whole story is about a miracle that Jesus performs, a miraculous act of God, a supernatural work. And so to suggest that there was some anti-supernaturalism at work is anti-rational. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense. And so there seems to be no reason why anyone would want to pull that out. But if the text was not there originally, 
as in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. And we said that they're reliable because they're closer to the source. The closer they are to the original documents, the less time there was for errors to creep into the text. These errors creep in not out of malice, not out of an attempt to distort the message of the scripture, but just because of human fallibility. The older the document, the less opportunity there is for an error to creep into the text. And so therefore, uh, we have a text which is more than likely uh, more accurate, more faithful to the original document than others that come to us at a much later date. So the older manuscripts do not have this little story in, inserted into the text. They don't have it at all. And so what accounts for its presence in the text such that the King James writers included it? Well, it's very simple to account for that. Some copyists might have seen the story and heard reports, uh, apocryphal, if you will, or uh, um, extra biblical reports. There's, a, 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 I think, an occurrence of the story in the writings of Tertullian. At any rate, someone heard the story, put it in as a, a marginal note into the copy of the text so that the reader could understand what was going on. Maybe he thought that maybe it should have been in the text, but he put it in the margin. Years later, when another copyist comes and looks at that manuscript and sees the note in the margin, he might wonder if that note was supposed to be in the text, and that's why it was in the margin. It seems to fit in the text, and so therefore, when he writes, rewrites that copy, he includes that marginal note into the text as though it was original with the text. We've seen that happen from time to time in the course of transmission. Uh, and, and so that would give a reasonable explanation for why that would be present in the text. And so more than likely, both in terms of our earliest and most authoritative manuscripts and for reasons explaining why it's present or not, the argument is in favor of the modern translations that it was not original with the text of Scripture. Now, we saw last week in our sermon that th that particular text has no bearing on the message of the gospel, no bearing on the person of Christ, the way of salvation, the sovereignty of God, no bearing on the supernatural, no bearing on the meaning of the text at all. Its presence is um, innocuous in the text. It doesn't harm the text one way or the other by its presence or its absence. It's just a helpful tidbit that might illumine the nature of the text. Now, one could argue that it might uh, not be accurate to include that in the text because maybe it was not an angel coming down onto the waters, but rather uh, with that being uh, uh, that, that pool being at the source, a spring and the minerals coming up out of that spring bubbling up from time to time. When the people dove into the water at that time, they're taking the benefit of those minerals and finding some sort of healing through that. We have hot springs in Arkansas where people go to find some relief from their maladies as well. So that may be all that was happening there. And the story might have been an apocryphal story, a, a legend with regard to that, that really does not have a basis in fact. The Bible is not anti-supernatural by any means. The Bible does not uh, argue against angels. It believes angels are operative in the world today. But it's not necessarily the case that every story about angels is true. Uh, so it's not necessarily the case that this story was true to the description of what took place there. At any event, you can rely on your, man, on your Bible, whether it's a, a King James Bible or a modern translation. The gospel is fully proclaimed in each and all of these translations. And you can know the way of grace through salvation in Jesus Christ uh, without any uh, doubt about it. Well, now we consider the notion of interpreting the Bible. And this is clearly a very important uh, topic to consider uh, with Dr. Sproul. How do we come to the Bible and properly interpret the scripture? After all, people will say, well, you have your opinion or that's your interpretation of the text. I have mine. And what has happened today is that there are a babel of voices, all kinds of people saying, this is what I see in the text of scripture. And this is the development over the last hundred years where in our postmodern world, our existentialist minded world, 
where everything is subjective and focused within and things make sense in terms of the way that I impose my rational order on the world, then when we come to the Bible, the, the modern tendency is to read the Bible and see what it says to me. I think it was last week we talked about the Christian pastor who says, listen for the word of God. It's not listen to the word of God, but listen for it. And maybe God will speak to you in some way while I'm reading this text of scripture. And so what counts is not what the author of the scripture intended to say, nor with the what the text itself actually says, but what I as the reader or as the hearer receive at that moment while I'm reading that text. And so the word of God to me might be something entirely different from what the original author intended to say. And so you have a, a, a subjectivism with regard to hearing or interpreting the word of God. And uh, there's all kinds of, in hermeneutics, all kinds of developments in that respect in speaking about the, the author of a text, the text itself, then the receptor or the hearer, the one who reads the text. And the meaning originated with the author, he puts it into a text, but the author's meaning and the text meaning may be slightly different. The author may intend to say one thing, but the text might, as a result, say something somewhat different or maybe read in a different light. And then finally, you have the reader who reads it and has his own opinion about it. And so in our modern age, uh, things have become uh, so subjectivized that there is a loss of objective truth. There's a loss of an external witness to us as to uh, what is accurate. And so we're going to talk about how to properly interpret the Bible and understand it for what it intends to say. And I'll remind you of this, which I uh, reminded our men this morning, that the word of God uh, comes to us with at least two authors. There is God, the sovereign, who uh, speaks his word to us. And everything that is written down is written for us from God. And we can know that it is the word of God. At the same time, it is the word of men. You have a wide variety of prophets and apostles over the course of 1,500 years from different points and positions in life whereby they communicate what they see, what they understand, or, and what, what they receive as the word of God. They proclaim that word, and that which they write, including sometimes what they speak, that which is written down, at least for us, is the inspired, inerrant word of God. God so preserves what they say and what they write down that everything is exactly what God intends for us to know. Uh, it is truly the word of God in propositions so that we might know and objectively be able to evaluate God's word. And so there are two authors, God and a man, an individual. And God speaks through that individual to communicate his will. There is the intent of the writer himself uh, as he writes his text. For example, in Luke's gospel, the beginning, uh, Luke, at the very start, talks about how he gathered information and consulted people and wanted to put everything in an orderly account so that uh, a disciple might be able to understand and know the things that we truly believe about Jesus Christ. And so the author tells us right from the start what his mindset is as he writes his gospel. The apostle John, in writing the gospel of John, tells us, what his purpose is in writing that gospel. These things are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. These authors give you their human perspective as to what they intend by their writings, and that happens throughout the pages of Scripture. But through that all, God himself is speaking, and he uses these authors to communicate his own very word to us. And so the divine authorship preserves the human authorship. The human authorship is finite, and the human authors themselves are fallible, but because they write under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, they write the very Word of God. They are preserved from error. And so we can expect that throughout their writings of the canon of Scripture, from Genesis through Revelation, we have one harmonious message of salvation through Jesus Christ.
And the Old and New Covenants all point us to that. And throughout the, the text of the Bible, Old and New Testaments, we have, uh, again, one harmonious message. And so there is no discordant note uh, sounded throughout that whole entire text. So we want to talk about interpreting the Bible, and we'll get started here with Dr. Sproul's comments, and I'll make comments along the way. Any written document must be interpreted if it is to be understood. The United States of America has nine highly skilled individuals whose daily task is to interpret the Constitution. They compose the Supreme Court of the land. To interpret the Bible is a far more solemn task than to interpret the U.S. Constitution. It requires great care and diligence. So, uh, kind of opportune, as we were noting this morning, in light, uh, uh, at this point in time in American history, uh, we have a U.S. Supreme Court nominee by the name of Brett Kavanaugh, who at this very moment has his candidacy before the United States Senate, uh, and he, he has been through a grueling, uh, uh, brutal process for his confirmation. Uh, and when should he arrive at the Supreme Court, it would be his responsibility, as well as the remaining eight justices, to look at the United States Constitution and interpret it, in my mind, in a strict constructionist sort of way. What did the original authors intend to say. What does the document actually say? We're not free to just imagine what we think it might say in our modern environment and uh, have that interpretation loosed from the actual words of the text. A strict reconstructionist or a, const a strict constructionist would go right to the text of the document, the, the Constitution, and say, this is what it says. And this is what we must abide by. If you're not happy with it, you have to amend the document because we're a nation governed by laws and not by opinions, a nation governed by laws and not by men. And so when we come to the Bible, we have a far more important task before us, not merely discerning a civil document for uh, legal purposes, but uh, God's word given to us. And we are responsible to examine that word and understand or interpret it uh, in light of current uh, situations. So, Sproul says, the Bible itself is its own supreme court. The chief rule of biblical interpret interpretation is sacred scripture is its own interpreter. This principle means that the Bible is to be interpreted by the Bible. What is obscure in one part of scripture may be made clear in another. To interpret Scripture by Scripture means that we must not set one passage of Scripture against another passage. Each text must be understood not only in light of its immediate context, but also in the context of the whole of Scripture. So first thing to know, Scripture is its own interpreter. If there is any question about the meaning of a text of Scripture, you go to other Scriptures that speak on the same subject, and they will illumine that obscure text of Scripture. So that uh, any questions, you go to the rest of Scripture. Since God is the author of Scripture, there can, there can be no higher authority to appeal to for interpreting God's Word. We don't go to the Pope, we don't go to the church, the councils, the pastors, what have you. Scripture ultimately is its own interpreter. And every understanding of Scripture must be subject to that which Scripture itself says. And so Scripture interprets itself by uh, reading one text in the light of its surrounding text. So read a verse in the light of the chapter, the chapter in the light of the book, the book in the light of the whole Bible. Old and New Testaments, and keeping in mind the flow of redemptive history going through the cross and resurrection of Christ. Um, every text is to be understood in its broader context, and you don't just simply go in, take one text that you like, pull it out, and say, this is what God's Word says, and apply a different interpretation to that text than what's given in the rest of Scripture of that one text. Scripture is its own interpreter. In addition, properly understood, 
The only legitimate and valid method of interpreting the, the Bible is the method of literal interpretation. Yet there is much confusion about the idea of literal interpretation. Literal interpretation, strictly speaking, means that we are to interpret the Bible as it is written. A noun is treated as a noun and a verb as a verb. It means that all the forms that are used in the writing of the Bible are to be interpreted according to the normal rules governing those forms. Poetry is to be treated as poetry. Historical accounts are to be treated as history. Parables as parables, hyperbole as hyperbole, and so on. Here's an important point and subject to some misunderstanding. Uh, we say that the Bible is to be understood literally, that, in, that is to say, uh, as it intends to be understood. The Bible does make use of figurative speech, uh, symbols, imagery, and these kinds of things. We don't understand figures of speech literally. We don't understand uh, imagery literally. Otherwise, you have some rather obscure, strange things. We recognize that there are symbols and uh, uh, parables told in Scripture that are not necessarily actual history. When Jesus tells the story of the parable sowing his soils, so, sowing the seed in different soils, he's not talking specifically about a certain event. He's talking about a general occurrence that is illustrative of a spiritual uh, situation, namely the uh, spreading of the Word of God and the advance of God's kingdom. So we interpret Scripture in accord with the way that it intends to be understood. So when we say we understand it literally, that doesn't mean we go to the book of Revelation and interpret everything there uh, literally. After all, the book is filled with symbols and types. And unless you understand those symbols and types, including numbers as symbols and types of different things, you're going to come up with some rather strange uh, interpretations, which... Many have, unfortunately. Clearly, the book of Revelation intends to be understood in, in a symbolic way, giving us a, a picture of heavenly truths that Christ is on the throne in heaven. He's ruling over the heavens and the earth and ruling all things for the good of his people. And he will indeed bring judgments upon the wicked and bring, this, bring history to a conclusion with this final return in glory. That's what the book of Revelation intends to say but it does so in a variety of figures and types and analogies and illustrations, these kinds of things. So if you interpret all those things with a stark literalness, you'll come up with strange things, like you find in dispensational premillennialism today. Um, so when we're reading poetry, the Psalms, we recognize that uh, figures of speech are used and we interpret the text accordingly. Um, Psalm 1 says that the righteous is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in its season. It's not literally to be understood that the righteous are trees and that you can see from them fruit hanging underneath them. It's just a symbol, a picture, illustrative of the spiritual life and how fruitful a spiritual life is. And so we look for the intent of the Word of God and not... Uh, strictly interpret it in a woodenly literal fashion. That comes uh, about in the prophecies of the Old Testament as well. Sometimes people want to have a, a, a woodenly literal interpretation of what Isaiah and Jeremiah are saying about the future, predicting about the future. Well, um, there are certain things which are they, they intend to be understood literally, that there will be a coming Christ, someone who will redeem us from our sin. But we don't interpret everything absolutely literally. If the coming Christ is to be the lamb that suffers for us, we don't look for an animal. We look for the Christ who is the substitute for our sins. I'm thinking of Isaiah 53 there. Um, you interpret it spiritually uh, in regard to the intent of the text. So... We need to understand the Bible in terms of what it's actually saying. Historical documents are to be understood historically. Uh, and and uh, the epistles, uh, rational, legal, theological arguments are to be understood in that respect. 
In this regard, the Bible is to be interpreted according to the rules that govern the interpretation of any book. In some ways, the Bible is unlike any other book ever written. However, in terms of its interpretation, it is to be treated as any other book. So you read the Bible like you would read uh, Shakespeare's plays or the newspaper or uh, a work of philosophy. You take into account what kind of work it is. Is it a work of philosophy, therefore nonfiction? Well, you read it and understand it in that light. It doesn't mean that it doesn't use illustrations, symbols, and types, and these kinds of things, but generally it's going to be a rational argument. Similarly, if you're reading the plays of Shakespeare, you recognize that they are fictitious accounts. They might be based on history, but they're illustrative of that history, and they, they shape that history to promote a particular point of view or to make fun of it or what have you. But you bear in mind the genre in which the work is written. History, philosophy, drama, uh, music, all these things go into our interpretation of the text. So the Bible is to be interpreted according to the rules that govern the interpretation of any book. It's a human document like any other human document in that respect. The Bible is not to be interpreted according to our own, our own desires and prejudices. We must seek to understand what it actually says and guard against forcing our own views upon it. It is the sport of heretics to seek support from Scripture for false doctrines that have no basis in the text. Satan himself quoted Scripture in an illegitimate way in an effort to seduce Christ to sin. Matthew 4, uh, verses 1 through 11. So uh, I talked to the men this morning about uh, the distinction between exegesis and eisegesis. By exegesis, we mean that it is the responsibility of the pastor to begin with and teachers of the Word of God, and then each of us to go to the Scriptures and understand what they are saying to us, allow the text to speak to us. The text is authoritative, and we uh, conform our understanding of ourselves and our world based on what the text says of us because it is the Word of God. It has authority over us. Eisegesis is the opposite, where we take the Word of God and we impose our own prejudices, our own biases, our own interpretations onto the Word of God. And so we only accept those texts of Scripture that conform to what we expect to find, or what we hope to find in those texts. I had a recent debate with uh, some folks about the role of women in the church and whether there should be women as pastors. Our modern view is that, yes, women should serve as pastors and as deacons and as elders. The office should be open to that. But when you go to the text of Scripture, it's rather plain, it seems to me, that the text speaks clearly that men are uh, designed by God to occupy the offices of pastor and elder and deacon and so forth, and that God has entrusted the care of his church to these men for his own sovereign purposes. And so we don't go to the text and read out of it what we want to see there so that it supports our own agenda. But we go to the text of Scripture and listen to what Scripture says, and that is ultimately authoritative for us. Same has to do with the, the subject of gay marriage and homosexuality. The modern view is these things should be accepted. And so we go to the Scripture and we try to shape the Scriptures in such a way that it conforms to what we want the scriptures to say. And so our former president, Obama, uh, says that scripture tells him that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so therefore, uh, we would expect that people would recognize our love and sanction it in marriage if that's what we wish. That takes a text entirely out of its context and applies it to a situation which uh, does violence to the, the original intent of that text which has nothing to do with the support of uh, gay sex or gay marriage. So exegesis is listening to the scripture and its, recognizing its authority to speak to us. It is of ultimate authority, and our understanding must be governed by what scripture says. We don't impose our views. We listen to what God says to us because the scripture is the word of God. Eisegesis reads our own ideas into the text and picks out and 
chooses those texts that support our idea, ideas and uh, removes the rest, does not consider the rest or reinterprets the rest in such a way that they are at least uh, not relevant to the discussion that we want to, to uh, hold. So uh, be reminded that we are to listen to Scripture and not impose our will on Scripture. The basic message of the Bible is simple enough and clear enough for a child to understand. Yet the meat of Scripture requires careful attention and study to understand it properly. Some matters treated by the Bible are so complex and so profound that they keep the finest scholars perennially uh, engaged in an effort to sort them out. So the basic message, message of the scriptures is clear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Uh, if you refuse to repent and turn to Christ, you will be damned. That's rather clear. Uh, it's rather clear as well that we are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. Those things are clear. A child can understand those things. You don't need to be a great intellect to uncover those things in the Bible. But there are different things that are very complex, and th some things are quite complex, and theologians wrestle over them. Um, we considered them earlier today in our men's group. Uh, one area of discussion is the sovereignty of God over all of the events of history. God has a sovereign plan for the course of history and ordains all that should take place from beginning to end. God knows what's going to take place throughout time because he has ordained it all. And so history will unfold according to his will. At the same time, God determines that man is responsible for his actions and we act freely in accord with our nature. And so when I uh, choose to commit sin, that is on me. I do that freely of my own will and I will be held accountable for that. And yet it is the case that God, through that, may accomplish his own purpose. The great uh, example of that is uh, what Peter had to say at Pentecost in his great sermon there, where he said that uh, the, the leaders of the Jews in Jerusalem crucified Christ. What greater evil could there be than that? They murdered the, the, the innocent Son of God. They put him to death on the cross. But... Through that, God accomplished a great work of salvation for us. And so men meant it for evil, but God intended good through it all. And uh, when we talk about the sovereignty of God then and man's responsibility, it might be challenging for us to try to understand how these things fit together. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But... Um, there are some things that are complex in Scripture that need a uh, considerable amount of thought. Dr. Sproul continues, There are a few principles of interpretation that are basic for all uh, sound study of the Bible. They include the following. First, narratives should be interpreted in light of teaching passages. For example, the story of Abraham offering Isaac on Mount Moriah might suggest that God didn't know that Abraham had true faith. Remember that the story was that God was going to test the faith of Abraham uh, to, to see its truthfulness, its strength. Um, so one might s gather that God really didn't know what was in Abraham's heart from that text, uh, if one reads it inappropriately, I would say. Um, but the didactic portions of Scripture make it clear that God is omniscient, that is, that God knows all things. So the rest of the Bible makes it very clear that God knows the human heart inside and out. There was nothing that God needed to know about Abraham. He knew it perfectly. He knew exactly what Abraham was going to do. In fact, God had ordained uh, that Abraham would take his son up onto that mountain and be prepared to sacrifice his son according to uh, God's command. And God intended for that event to be a symbol and type for the church of God, of what God would do in sending his own son. Uh, not Isaac, but the son of it, the child of Abraham, the son of David, Jesus Christ, who would go to the cross and bear the penalty for our sins. Jesus would indeed suffer the stroke of God's wrath for us at the cross. Abraham's son Isaac uh, 
would be spared because he was not that substitute for our sins. You recall that God provided a, a lamb for the offering there. It was stuck, in, I think it was a ram, it was stuck in the uh, uh, thorn bushes nearby. And so God spared Isaac. But it was all designed by God's purpose. And the rest of Scripture illumines that text for us. So we, we interpret uh, stories like that, his, history, parables, all the rest of it, in view of the more didactic, plain uh, passages of Scripture that address an issue. Second, the implicit must always be interpreted in light of the explicit, never the other way around. That is, if a particular text seems to imply something, we should not accept the implication as correct if it goes against something explicitly stated elsewhere in Scripture. Um, so you might have a, an imp implication drawn from a text of Scripture, for example, and I'm just making this up, that it's okay for a man to beat his wife, maybe because there's an example of that occurring in the Bible. And so since it's not immediately uh, commented on, you draw the implication that a, a husband, a, a man might beat his wife without repercussion. But you go through the rest of Scripture and you find that that is not the case because the explicit teachings of Scripture forbid that kind of action. We are, as husbands, to love our wives and sacrifice ourselves for them and for their benefit. And so we are to cherish our wives as we would our own bodies. And so any kind of uh, uh, abuse of one's wife is uh, eliminated or ruled out by the express statements of Scripture. Uh, one of the men in our group uh, challenged me to come up with a, another example of that from Scripture. And I pointed again to the temptation of Satan where he has Jesus up on the high pinnacle of the temple and he's to look over that and Satan says, why don't you jump off the, the pinnacle of the temple and, and, and land on the ground because Scripture says that uh, he will protect your foot from being dashed against a stone and not a bone of you will be broken. He's quoting, from, I believe, from one of the Psalms. And so he's making an implicit deduction from a Psalm and suggesting that Jesus jump off that temple and fall to the ground. Um, Jesus takes that implicit uh, uh, statement, that, if you will, that implication of the text, and uh, refutes it from the clearer statement given in the book of Deuteronomy that you uh, are not to force a test on the Lord your God. Here is a, a, an explicit statement with regard to tempting God and just seeing if God will live up to his word by jumping off uh, a temple and seeing if he'll protect the Christ, the Messiah. That was not the intention of that original text, and Satan distorted the text for his own purposes. But the Lord Jesus saw through it and interpreted the implicit by the explicit. And so that's the point of Dr. Sproul's uh, statement here. Third, the laws of logic govern biblical interpretation. If, for example, we know that all cats have tails, we cannot then deduce that some cats do not have tails. If it is true that some cats do not have tails, then it cannot also be true that all cats have tails. This is not a matter merely of technical laws of inference. It is a matter of common sense. Yet the vast majority of erroneous interpretations of the Bible are caused by illegitimate deductions from the Scripture. So Dr. Sproul is using some basic laws of logic that uh, uh, if you make a universal statement, all cats have tails, then you cannot have also true uh, a statement that denies that, that some cats don't have tails. That would be a contradiction. And uh, so when you come to a text of Scripture, you should use your logic. You should reason and, and work through and seek for the inner harmony of the text. Uh, you should not pit one text against the other and say, this one contradicts that. Uh, that's the, the liberal approach today with regard to the resurrection narratives or uh, claims to the deity of Christ. There are attempts to uh, 
pit one text of Scripture against the other and to say, you see, there they contradict. Well, uh, I would suggest to begin with, they uh, start on a, a false assumption that the Bible is a merely human document filled with errors and that Jesus is not the Christ, the Son of God. And when you go into the text with those assumptions, then you're going to look for all kinds of errors and contradictions. But when you understand that the text is the written word of God and that Jesus is indeed the Christ, then you'll begin to see the harmonious nature of all these texts and how they all relate to each other seamlessly. Now, there are some things that are difficult to bring together, admittedly. Uh, our understanding of these things needs to grow. But we use the ordinary rules of logic to sort out these things to make sure that we have properly understood the text of Scripture. Now, uh, to return to a previous uh, conversation, we must be careful about applying the rules of logic to the Scriptures. There are some things that are given to, to us in Scripture that are obscure, mysterious, paradoxical, as we considered some weeks ago. Uh, God is three persons, and yet he is one. Uh, Jesus is uh, two natures, one person. How do we understand these things? Uh, God is sovereign over all the events uh, of history and has ordained all that should take place. And yet man is responsible for his actions and must give an account for them at the end of history and time. These same things seem to be contradictory. And our logic would say, well, they are apparently contradictory, and so therefore we must reject one or the other or both. And I would suggest to you that here is where our understanding of Scripture comes into play. Scripture is ultimately authoritative, and our human reasoning must be subject to the Word of God so that we come to the Scriptures recognizing that God is greater than us. He is infinite. He is all-wise, all-knowing. And so there are some things that are given to us plainly in Scripture, which we see and recognize. God is sovereign, ordains all things, yet man is responsible. We see that clearly uh, taught in Scripture. At the same time, we don't know how those things cohere, how they integrate with each other. But... We don't just simply dismiss the whole thing or adopt one and reject the other. We recognize both as true, but we don't know how to reconcile them. But we do, in faith, rest that God knows and understands how these things do uh, relate to each other. And with God being infinite, all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful, we trust that he has an explanation for all these things. He understands those things. God is God. He is the creator. We are the creatures. We cannot have God explain everything to us to our satisfaction. Uh, then we would be as gods. We cannot uh, expect that uh, we will not accept anything from God unless we can comprehend it fully and completely. Uh, that would be ridiculous. And so we must account for mystery in Scripture and not use our human logic to reject that which God has clear, clearly and unambiguously given to us in Scripture. Logic is submissive to Scripture, and that's the point that I want to make. It is subject to God's revelation. But at the same time, it is a tool whereby we try to understand what the plain meaning of Scripture is. So it must be taken in the context of the authority of Scripture. Well, I hope that's all helpful for you, and let me give you some summary statements from Dr. Sproul that pulls all of this together for you. First, as a reminder, the Bible is its own interpreter. We go to Scripture to find out what is the, the meaning of a particular text. Second, we must interpret the Bible literally as it is, as it is written, or as I understand it, as it intends to be understood. Literal text understood literally, uh, figurative text understood figuratively, but all of it true in accord with God's word and will. Third, the Bible is to be interpreted like any other book, drama, history, philosophy, uh, what have you, interpreted as uh, it's in accord with its genre. Fourth, Obscure parts of the Bible are to be interpreted by the clearer parts. And I would remind you of the words of the Apostle Peter, 
who read the writings of the Apostle Paul with regard to the apocalypse, the end of all things, and he said that with regard to Paul's writings, there are some things that are hard to understand, which the unstable and untaught distort, as they do the rest of scriptures. So the Apostle Peter, looking at the writings of the Apostle Paul, says there are some things here that are complex that even he has a hard time understanding. But those who are unstable and uh, untaught distort these things, running off with all kinds of theories and ideas and false teachings. They distort Paul as they do the rest of Scripture. And incidentally, of course, Peter is affirming that the writings of Paul are authoritative Scripture and stand on the same level as the writings of Moses and David, Isaiah and Jeremiah and so forth. They are scripture. Um, so that's an important acknowledgement of the New Testament as inspired word of God. Okay. Fifth, the implicit is to be interpreted in light of the explicit. So never just take a text and see what it implies, because it might imply a wide variety of things if you take it out of its broader context. But consider what is implicit in a text uh, abstractly in view of its greater context, and especially in view of those texts of Scripture that speak explicitly on that particular topic. Those are of greater authority than the implicit uh, deductions. Sixth, the rules of logic govern what can reasonably draw, be drawn or deduced from Scripture. So uh, we're not to leave our minds behind. We're not to just uh, aimlessly go through the Scriptures, but we should study them, evaluate them, try to reconcile things, pull the things together, see relationships between them, how one implies the other. Um, we go through Paul's book of Romans. We should observe the, the reasonable, logical way in which he develops his argument and uh, go through Ephesians chapter 1 and see how Paul talks about our uh, being chosen of God and all the uh, outworkings of his sovereign will for our redemption. And we should reason that out and try to understand it. Uh, that's all appropriate. Okay, I hope that's helpful for you. Uh, in interpreting Scripture. Next week, Lord willing, we'll consider uh, private interpretations of Scripture, and we'll talk about, we'll get into the debate between the Protestant and the Roman Catholic Church in particular with regard to the right of individuals to privately interpret Scripture, whereas the church, the Roman Church, says that interpretation is the provenance of the Pope and the Holy See, and the, it's the church at Rome that authoritatively tells us what to believe, whereas the Protestant church says that every individual is a, a priest and has the right of interpreting the Bible according to their conscience. And we'll develop those ideas further and, and see uh, uh, how they should be understood in their appropriate light. So I hope that will be of interest to you. This is Pastor McLaren for First Presbyterian Church in Perkesee, Pennsylvania. Uh, please join us every Sunday as we uh, develop God's Word, as you get to see me week after week interpreting Scripture. You'll see it live happening right before your eyes, as it were, as the Word of God is exegeted before you. It's my uh, calling and responsibility to explain all that God's Word has to say, even when uh, it, it speaks not well of me or members of my audience or members of the, the broader audience at large. The scripture is of highest authority and it must speak freely uh, and without uh, any uh, shading of that message. And uh, by the grace of God, that's what we do here. Uh, so please join us on Sundays. Our services begin at 930. We are located on the corner of 5th and Race Streets in Perkesee. It's a small red brick building across from the firehouse, if you're familiar with Perkesee. And uh, we invite you to come and join us. So take care. May God bless you. And may he bless your reading of his holy word. Take care.